The fire was gone. The storm was not. Across the Great Plains, the wind howled sharp, endless, without mercy. No trees, no branches, nothing to burn. Just no sky and the sound of breath freezing in the dark. The people had no forest to cut no shelter strong enough for the cold. The land was open, white, alive, and cruel. The Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Blackfeet, they faced it all the same. The fire could die, but not the will to endure. I felt that kind of cold before the kind that tests what still moves inside you. No firewood, no safety, just the wind. And the question still remains, how did they survive when the firewood was gone? Across the Great Plains, winter came without mercy. There were no forests to hide and no mountains to block the wind. Just open land, cold, flat, endless. The snow didn't fall softly here. It came like a curtain pulled tight across the world. The horizon vanished and even sound froze in the air. To the Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Blackfeet, this was home. A land without shelter, a land that asked for patience, not defiance. They didn't build walls to stop the storm. They learned to move with it. The wind was not an enemy, it was a teacher. Every gust carried a lesson about endurance, timing, and respect. If you've ever stood in that kind of wind, you know it cuts through everything. It finds the cracks in your clothes, the tremble in your breath. But to the plains, people, that same wind-shaped strength. They read it like a map, knowing when to travel, when to rest, when to wait. They built their homes low and round, facing the wind, but never resisting it. Tipis turned with the seasons, their poles bending, but never breaking. Buffalo hides stretched tight trapping air, the way lungs hold breath. Each home breathed with the land expanding in warmth, tightening in cold. It was not comfort they sought, but balance. The cold wasn't a punishment. It was a test, a reminder that survival wasn't about fighting harder, but about understanding deeper. They watched the herds, the clouds, the shape of snow on the hills. When the earth spoke, they listened, and in that listening, they endured. The Great Plains were vast, yes, but never empty. To those who knew them, they were alive. The snow, the wind, the silence, all were voices of the same world. A world that did not forgive mistakes, but rewarded those who moved with its rhythm. No firewood, no forest, but they still found warmth buried in the ground itself. Before sunset, the people of the northern plains gathered river stones, smooth, heavy, cold. They knew the danger of haste. If a stone held even a drop of river water inside, it could burst when heated. So they chose carefully stones sun-dried for days, white, gray, and hollow sounding when struck. Each one was a promise of warmth, but only if treated with patience. They placed the dry stones around a small fire, letting them warm slowly, not fast. Crack one too soon, and it could explode. Let it breathe, and it would hold the heat through the night. When the glow beneath the ash turned deep orange, they used bone tongs to move the stones into shallow pits beneath the teepee floor. A layer of earth and hide went over them, sealing the heat inside. When the fire above died, the fire below began to live. You could feel it, that quiet warmth rising through the ground. Not a burn, not a blaze, just steady breath. It was the earth exhaling through stone, by dawn, the frost around the sleeping area melted away in a soft ring. No smoke, no flame, just silence and warmth. Archaeologists still find those pits today, blackened circles of cracked basalt and granite layered with ash and bone. Proof that these people didn't burn the land they understood it. They learned to make the earth itself a hearth. If you've ever watched your campfire fade, you know the pull to feed it again. But they didn't chase flame. They buried it, under soil, under hide, a slow heart beating through the night. Even when the wind screamed outside, that fire stayed faithful. Their wisdom was simple. Fire dies fast in the open. But when you bury it, it learns to last. They buried their fire and slept above its breath. Most people fear snow. They see it as death, cold, heavy, suffocating. But to the Algonquian and Cree snow was not the enemy. It was protection. They learned that snow when packed by the wind traps, air between its layers. 
That air, not the ice, was the secret. Air holds warmth. Even in a blizzard, the snow just above the ground stayed near freezing while the air outside could drop to 40 below. So instead of avoiding snow, they used it. Before the storm hit, families carved low walls around their teepees, bending snow into shape with hide-covered shovels. The walls caught the wind, slowed it turned it aside. Inside that circle, the air went still and the cold lost its teeth. In deeper storms, they dug shallow pits no higher than a man's knees. They spread hides across the hollow, then built their fires small and low. Heat gathered under the skin of the earth, and the snow above became their roof. You'd think the fire would melt through, but it didn't. Dry, compact snow reflected the heat back down. It insulated like fur. Even in minus 30, the inside stayed just above freezing a difference that meant life or death. At night, the snow walls glowed faintly blue under the moonlight. From outside, a teepee wrapped in snow looked dead and still. But inside, you could hear quiet breathing, the soft crackle of fat fire, and the calm rhythm of survival. The air felt thick, not warm, but safe. They didn't fight the cold, they shaped it. If you've ever sat in a snowstorm, you know that silence has weight. For them, it was a blanket. The snow muffled, the wind held the heat soften the world until morning. They called it the sleeping wind because what others feared, they learned to rest beneath. The cold became their blanket. The cold didn't only come from the air, it came from below. The frozen earth pulled warmth out of the body like a thief in the dark. No fire could stop that. So the plains tribes learned to build warmth from the ground up. They began with reeds, dry, hollow light as bone. Laid flat, they formed the first layer of defense. Above that came buffalo grass, soft but dense trapping air in its tangle. Then came the hides, thick, heavy breathing with the body. Buffalo hides on top elk or deer beneath, layered like the skin of the earth itself. Each layer had purpose. The reeds lifted the sleeper above frost. The grass trapped air, slowing the escape of heat. And the hides sealed it all, holding warmth inside like a living shell. It was insulation long before anyone knew the word. Archaeologists later found these layers still pressed into the soil rings of flattened grass overlapping hides turned to dark leather under time. Proof that they understood thermal balance better than most builders today. No tools, no science, just observation, patience, and repetition. If you've ever slept on frozen ground, you know how quickly it steals from you. The cold creeps through your back, slow and merciless. But lie on layers like these, and you feel something different. The ground doesn't bite, it exhales. It becomes part of your warmth instead of taking it away. At night, when the wind rattled, the teepee families slept close their bodies, pressed against hides warmed by their own breath. The air beneath them stayed trapped, alive and kind. The warmth didn't rise from flame, it rose from what they slept upon. They called it the breathing ground. Because when the fire went out, the earth still remembered. Warmth rose from what they slept upon, not what they burned. When the wood was gone, they turned to the hunt. Because inside every animal, there was fire. Not from flame, but from fat. The Blackfeet and Northern Athabascans knew how to keep that fire alive. After a kill, they boiled down the marrow, the scraps, the layers of fat that wrapped the ribs. Slowly over hours, it became grease, thick, heavy, golden. They poured it into shallow bowls carved from bone or stone. Sometimes they used skull fragments, sometimes smooth river rock with a hollow ground into its face. Each became a lamp, a small, quiet heart of light. A single handful could burn for hours. No smoke, no sparks, just a steady orange flame, no bigger than a thumb. It gave light enough to see and heat enough to live. The women tended these lamps through the night, trimming the wick made from twisted sinew or dried moss. They learned how much air each flame needed too much and it would flicker out. Too little and it would choke. The balance was exact. You could hear the faint hiss of melting grease, smell the sweetness of fat turning to warmth. It wasn't a roaring blaze, it was a living ember small, steady, 
patient, perfect for a tippy where smoke had nowhere to go. In the morning, the bowls would cool and the grease would harden again. They scraped it clean, added more, and lit it once more with a coal from the previous night. Nothing wasted, nothing lost. Each drop of fat was a day of survival stored in the body of the hunt. If you've ever watched a candle burn in silence, you know that kind of peace, the kind that hums instead of roars. They didn't need firewood to see through the dark. They carried their fire inside a bowl, small, silent, enduring. When the fire burned low, the people drew closer. They didn't wait for the cold to take them. They met it together. Because warmth, they learned, was not only from flame, it was from each other. Inside the lodges of the Mandan and Hidatsa, the nights were long and bitter. The wind howled through every crack of the plains. Yet under the hides, there was still life quiet, steady human. They formed circles, always circles. Feet pointed toward the center bodies, curved around like petals of a sleeping flower. Each person covered in hides that overlapped trapping air between them. The outer layer of skin blocked the wind. The inner layer, their breath, did the rest. Anthropologists call it biothermal cooperation. The old ones simply called it family. Each body gave off heat, 70, maybe 100 watts enough that in a small lodge, the air rose 10, sometimes 15 degrees. Not enough to sweat, but enough to live. That was the geometry of survival warmth shared not wasted. Children slept between elders, elders beside hunters. No one was left at the edge. Even the dogs curled in the spaces between. Every exhale became another's shelter. Every heartbeat added to the circle. If you've ever camped in deep cold, you know that silence grows heavy before dawn. That's when the circle mattered most. One person shifted, another turned, and the hides breathed again. No words, no commands, just the rhythm of life refusing to fade. By morning, frost clung to the outside of the hides, but inside it stayed soft, almost warm. They didn't chase warmth, they became it. Not by fighting the cold, but by learning to move as one body. Even now, in the way we huddle close to a campfire, the memory remains. The fire is smaller than we think. The warmth has always come from us. The storm always returns. The cold never forgets. But what kept them alive wasn't luck. It was preparation. They knew the land would turn on them. So they listened to it first. They learned that warmth isn't built in a moment. It's gathered layer by layer, choice by choice. Every stone heated. Every hide placed, every hand full of fat saved. Each one was a promise to tomorrow. They didn't fight the winter, they worked with it. They used the snow, the wind, the herd, even the silence. Nothing wasted, nothing ignored. Because in the north, the smallest mistake wasn't cold, it was death. And yet, they didn't fear it. They respected it. They accepted the storm as a teacher, not a punishment. When the blizzard came, they didn't run, they adjusted. When firewood ran out, they didn't panic, they remembered. You start to understand something after enough winters. That survival isn't about strength. It's about patience. It's about discipline. It's about listening before acting, moving with the world, not against it. And maybe that's the lesson the old ones left behind, that warmth isn't only heat, it's awareness, it's endurance, it's trust. Because no matter how far we've come, the fire still fades, the wind still cuts, and the lesson remains the same. Stay calm, stay ready, stay close. The storm passed, the snow stayed, but the warmth stayed longer. The fires are gone now, the shelters buried, but their ways remain in the land, in the wind, in us. They carried no wood, only wisdom. They learned that warmth was not something you lit, it was something you carried. Every stone that held heat, every hide that breathed, every circle that shared, it all meant one thing, endurance. And when the last ember faded, they didn't chase it. They sat close. They remembered, because the fire never truly dies. It only moves from flame to memory, from hand to heart. So when your night turns cold, don't run from it. Sit close, listen, and stay by the fire.